Purgatory, Chapter 11, The Pain of Sense, Torment of Fire and Torment of Cold, Venerable Bede and Derithalum. If the pain of loss makes us a feeble impression upon us, it is far different from the pain of sense, the torment of fire, the torture of a sharp and intense cold, affrights our sensibility. This is why divine mercy, wishing to excite a holy fear in our souls, speaks but little of the pain of loss, but we are continually shown the fire, the cold, the other torments, which constitute the pain of sense. This is what we see in the Gospel, and in particular revelations, but which God is pleased to manifest to his servants from time to time the mysteries of the other life. Let us mention one of these revelations. In the first place, let us see what the pious and learned Cardinal Bellarmine quotes from this venerable bead. England has been witnesses in our own days, writes Bede, to a singular prodigy which may be compared to the miracles of the first ages of the Church. To excite the living to fear the death of the soul, God permits that a man, after having slept the sleep of death, should return to life and renew what he had seen in the other world. That frightful unheard of detail which he relates in his life of extraordinary penance, which correspond with his words, produced a lively impression throughout the country. I will now resume the principal circumstances of this history. There was in Numberland a man named Deratham, who, with his family, led a most Christian life. He fell sick, and his malady increased day by day. He was soon reduced to extremity, and died, to the great desolation and grief of his wife and children. The latter passed the night in tears by the remains. But the following day, before his interment, they saw him suddenly return to life, arise and place himself in a sitting posture. At this sight they were seized with such fear that they all took flight, with the exception of the wife who, trembling, remained alone with her risen husband. He reassured her immediately. Fear not, he said. It is God who restores me to my life. He wishes to show in my person a man raised from the dead. I have yet longed to live upon earth, but my new life will be very different from the one I led before. Then he arose full of health, went straight to the chapel of the church of that place, and there remained long in prayer. He returned home only to take a leave of those who had been dear to him upon earth, to whom he declared that he would live only to prepare himself for death, and advised them to do likewise. Then having divided his property into three parts, he gave one to his children, another to his wife, and reserved the third part to give in alms. When he had distributed all to the poor, and had reduced himself to extreme indigence, he went and knocked at the door of a monastery, and begged the abbot to receive him as a penitent religious, who would be a servant to all the others. The abbot gave him a retired cell, which he occupied for the rest of his life. Three exercises divided his time, prayer, the hardest labor, and extraordinary penances. The most rigorous fast he accounted as nothing. In winter he was seen to plunge himself into frozen water and remain there four hours and hours in prayer, whilst he recited the whole Psalter of David. The mortified life of Dirthalem, his downcast eyes, even his features indicated a soul struck with fear of the judgments of God. He kept a perpetual silence, but on being pressed to relate, for the edification of others, what God had manifested to him after his death, he thus described his vision. On leaving my body, I was received by a benevolent person who took me under his guidance. His face was brilliant, and he appeared surrounded with light. He arrived at a large damp valley of immense extent, and fire on one side, all ice and snow on the other. On the one hand, braziers and cauldrons of flame, on the other, most intense cold in the blast of a glacial wind. 
This mysterious valley was filled with innumerable souls, which tossed, as by a furious tempest, threw themselves from one side to the other. When they could no longer endure the violence of the fire, they sought relief amidst the ice and snow, but finding out only a new torture, they cast themselves again into the midst of the flames. I contemplated in a stupor these continual vicissitudes of horrible torments, and as far as my sight could extend, I saw nothing but a multitude of souls which suffered without even having repose. The very aspect inspired me with fear. I thought at first I saw hell, but my guide, who walked before me, turned to me and said, No, this is not, as you think, the hell of the reprobate. Do you know, he continued, what place this is? No, I answered. No, he resumed, that this valley, where you see so much fire and so much ice, is the place where the souls of those are punished who, during life, have neglected to confess their sins and who have deferred their conversion to the end. Thanks to the special mercy of God, they have had the happiness of sincerely repenting before death, of confessing and detesting their sins. This is why they are not damned, and only the great day of judgment they will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Several of them will obtain their deliverance before that time, but the merits of prayers, alms, and fasts offered in their favor by the living, and especially in the virtue of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, offered for their relief. Such was the recital of Dithron, when asked why he so rudely treated his body. While he plunged himself into frozen water, he replied that he had seen other torments in cold of another kind. If his brethren expressed astonishment that he could endure these extraordinary austerities, I have seen, he said, penances still more astonishing. To the day when it pleased God to call to him to himself, he ceased not to afflict his body, and although broken down with age, he could accept no alleviation. This event produced a deep sensation in England. A great number of sinners, touched by the words of Diflam, and struck by the austerities of his life, became sincerely converted. This fact, adds Bellarmine, appears to me of incontestable truth, since besides being conformable to the words of Holy Scripture, let him pass from the snow waters to excessive heat. Job 29.19 Venerable Bede relates this as a recent and well-known event. More than this, it was followed by the conversion of a great number of sinners. The sign of the work of God, who is accustomed to work prodigies in order to produce fruits and souls. Purgatory, Chapter 12 Pains of Purgatory, Bellarmine and St. Catherine the Admirable The learned and pious cardinal then proceeds to relate the history of St. Catherine the Admirable, who lived in Belgium at the close of the 12th century, and whose body is preserved today in St. Trond, in the Church of the Redemptor's Fathers. The life of this illustrious virgin was, he says, written by Thomas de Contempore, a religious of the order of St. Dominic, an author worthy of credit and a contemporary with the saint. Cardinal James de Vitry, in the preface of the life of Maria de Ognes, speaks of a great number of holy women and illustrious virgins, but the one whom he admires above all the others is St. Catherine, of whom he relates the most wonderful deeds. This servant of God, having passed the first years of her life in humility and patience, died at the age of thirty-two. When she was about to be buried, and the body was already in the church, resting in an open coffin, according to the custom of the time, she arose full of vigor, stupefying with amazement the whole city of St. Trond, which had witnessed this wonder. The astonishment increased when they learned from her own mouth what had happened to her after her death. Let us hear her own account of it. As soon, she said, as my soul was separated from my body, 
It was received by angels, who conducted it to a very gloomy place, entirely filled with souls. The torments with which they endured appeared to me so excessive that it is impossible for me to give any idea of their rigor. I saw among them many of my acquaintances, and deeply touched by their sad condition, I asked what place it was, for I believed it to be in hell. My guide answered me that it was purgatory, where sinners were punished, who before death had repented of their faults, but had not made worthy satisfaction to God. From thence I was conducted into hell, and there is also I recognized many of the reprobates whom I have formerly known. The angels then transported me into heaven, even to the throne of the divine majesty. The Lord regarded me with a favorable eye, and I experienced an extreme joy because I thought to obtain the grace of dwelling eternally with him. But my heavenly Father, seeing that I passed in my heart, said to me these words, Assuredly, my dear daughter, you will one day be with me. Now, however, I allow you to choose either to remain with me henceforth from this time, or to return to earth to accomplish a mission of charity and sufferings, in order to deliver from the flames of purgatory those souls which have inspired you with so much compassion. You shall suffer for them upon earth, and you shall endure great torments, without, however, dying from their effects. And not only will you receive the departed, but the example which you will give the living, and your life of continual sufferings, will lead sinners to be converted and to expiate their crimes. After having ended this new life, you shall return here laden with merits. At these words, seeing the great advantages offered to me for souls, I replied without hesitation that I would return to life, and I arose at that same instant. It is for the sole object, the relief of the departed and the conversion of sinners, that I have returned to the world. Therefore, be not astonished at the penances that I shall practice, nor at the life that you will see me lead from henceforward. It will be so extraordinary that nothing like it will ever be seen. All this was related by the saint herself. Let us now see what the biographer adds in the different chapters of her life. Christine immediately commenced the work for which she had been sent by God, renouncing all the comforts of life and reduced to extreme destitution. She lived without house or fire, more miserable than the birds of the air, which have the nest to shelter them. Not content with these privations, she eagerly sought all that she could to cause her suffering. She threw herself into burning furnaces, and there suffered so great torture that she could no longer bear it. She uttered the most frightful cries. She remained for a long time in the fire, and yet, on coming forth, no sign of burning was found upon her. In winter, when the muse was frozen, she plunged herself into it, staying in what cold river not only hours and days, but for entire weeks all the while praying to God and imploring his mercy. Sometimes, whilst praying in the icy waters, she allowed herself to be carried by the current down the mill, the wheel of which whirled her around in a manner frightful to behold, yet without breaking or dislocating one of her bones. On other occasions, fawed by dogs, which bit and tore her flesh, she ran enticing them into the thickets and among the thorns, until she was covered with blood. Nevertheless, on her return, no wound or scar had been seen. Such are the works of an admirable penance described by the author of the life of St. Christine. This writer was a bishop, a suffragan of the Archbishop of Cumbrae. And we have, says Bellarmine, reason to believe in his testimony, since he was for guarantee another grave author. James de Vitry, bishop and cardinal, and because he relates what happened in his own time and even in the province where he lived. Besides, the sufferings of this admirable virgin were not hidden. Everyone could see that she was the midst of the flames without being consumed, 
and covered with wounds, every trace of which disappeared a few moments afterwards. But more than this was the marvelous life she led for forty-two years after she had raised from the dead, God clearly showing that the wondrous wrought in her were by virtue from on high. The striking conversions which she effected, and the evident miracles which occurred after her death, manifestly proved the finger of God, and the truth of what which, after her resurrection, she had revealed concerning the other life. Thus argues Bellarmine, God willed to silence those libertines who make open profession of believing in nothing, and who have the audacity to ask in scorn, Who has returned from the other world? Who has even seen the torments of the hell or purgatory? Behold these two witnesses. They assure us that they have seen them, and that they are dreadful. What follows then, if not that the incredulous are inexcusable, and that those who believe and nevertheless neglect to do penances are still more to be condemned?